All right, uh, good afternoon and welcome to session four of the policy strand of the High School Climate Change Symposium, The Politics of Carbon Pricing. This session is being recorded. Our speaker for this session is Professor Barry Rabe from the University of Michigan. Uh, Barry G. Rabe is the JIRA and Nikki Harris Family Professor at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. He holds a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago and is the author of six books, including Can We Price Carbon, MIT Press 2018, and Trump, The Administrative Presidency and Federalism, Brookings Institution Press 2020. He teaches a wide range of courses on environmental politics and policy, American politics and public management, and is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your knowledge with us, Dr. Ray. The floor is yours. Jacob, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to you and Casey, all your colleagues who have put this together. I think that this is a terrific program. I'm delighted to join you and share some thoughts, but a genuine shout out to all of you who are participating in this. And certainly having worked on a number of conferences myself over the years, I know what a heavy lift it is to bring all of this to bear, particularly under pandemic circumstances. So a shout out to all of you and a thanks. Um, you know, Jacob, as you mentioned, my role at the University of Michigan um, is based principally in the public policy school named by former Michigander, former president Gerald Ford. And one of the things that we think a lot about in both our undergraduate and graduate programs in public policy are the ways we can bring different social science disciplines together to understand what is possible and what can actually be achieved through public policy, through government action. As Jacob noted, my training is in political science, but I regularly work with a team of faculty who look at political issues, public management issues, economic issues, using different methodologies and the like to, to, to look at these questions across many areas of policy, both in the United States and internationally. And so what I'll be talking about today really focuses on the issue of politics or what I like to think of as political feasibility. If we have an interesting idea for policy, something we might want to apply to address or try to address the climate crisis or hunger or other kinds of issues or the pandemic, the kind of question I raise is not the, so much the technical economic side of it, what will the cost issues be, but I work with those aspects and issues, but is it politically possible in a, under a political system in the state of Michigan, for me in the city of Ann Arbor, the United States, the government of Canada, I do a lot of work in Canada. Is it politically possible to do something or is it interesting or a good idea just that? A good idea, but one that we could just never gain political support and acceptance for. And much of what I'll be talking about today distills from one of the two books that um, Jacob kindly mentioned, Can We Price Carbon? A book I wrote and published two years ago that has a question mark at the end of it. And part of that was looking over many years in the US but around the world at this question of what is a carbon price, which I'll try to define for you in a bit. But is that politically possible to do that in a Michigan or an American or a Canadian or even a global context? Or is it just an interesting idea? So first of all, let's just sort of think about forerunners of this. And, and let me engage in a true story. Um, imagine that the United States had an abundant ability to produce a commodity that was legal to produce, to refine, and to use. It's, production, distribution, use was not against the law. It created a lot of jobs. And so in a lot of states and a lot of congressional districts, a lot of people were employed in this field. And it's a field I learned about as a young person because my dad worked in this industry and his livelihood depended on continued 
use of and consumption of this product. But then what do you do if you find out that this product that is abundant and does have some real upsides to it, including jobs, causes problems, causes harm to people or poses risks, not maybe right away, but over time. And what do you do? And in this case, I'm talking not about oil and gas, but tobacco. And think about it for a moment. Not sure at your school just what the culture is for tobacco, but back when I was in high school, that's a while ago, teachers would routinely smoke on our campus in the lounge. Students routinely would go out for tobacco and smoking breaks between classes and after school and before school, there was no restriction once you left the building of smoking. Tobacco was readily accessible, it was plentiful. And I actually, again, knew about this industry because my dad sold the product in suburban Chicago and actually around the city of Chicago. But of course there was a great risk to this product. This was a product that was again, produced, sold, distributed, many places in the United States, exported by the US as a benefit and a commodity and a strong series of government subsidies that had been created. There was also a kind of public relations or almost an advertising pitch behind this. This is well before he became a president or governor of California, Ronald Reagan, then an actor and a television star advertising. But this was in a period, 40s, 50s, even into the early 60s, where celebrities, including athletes, including some great members of the Detroit Tigers, would talk about how great it was to smoke, how it would calm them down before big games and all the rest. And yet it began to shift. When I was in high school, about 44% of adult Americans smoke cigarettes on a regular basis. Now that's down to about 10% almost an unthinkable kind of train change and transition. And how did that happen? Well, a whole bunch of reasons. Some of them involving revelations about the science and life expectancy issues if you smoke, uh, but also a number of policy tools, restrictions and regulations. Went back to my high school a few times in the last decade and teachers don't smoke at least publicly anymore. Students aren't allowed to get it, bring it anywhere on the campus, et cetera, et cetera. But by most accounts, the biggest single driver is the taxation, the power of federal and state governments to put a very steep set of taxes on every pack of cigarettes, created a classic economic supply and demand situation. As you add taxes and dramatically crank up the cost of a product, consumption purchasing goes down. Not the only force, not the only factor, but then of course, in the tobacco case in a great many states, a lot of the money from that taxes that still is being collected is put directly into public health, tobacco cessation programs and the like. And I think it's fairly well known. I found this out really heavily when I began to do my research on the development of the idea of a carbon price is how much this very idea of putting a price on the use, not just of tobacco, but fossil fuels, coal, natural gas, oil. Pegging a tax or a price or some equivalent system linked to the amount of carbon content or climate estimated climate damage was an idea that's been kicking around in the discipline of economics for generations, arguably a century or more. And it's interesting because there have been times in this century, especially in the first decade or so, that it seemed like inevitably the United States would develop a plan or a policy to price or tax carbon and that governments all around the world would do much the same thing. Why did we think this? Well, this is a bit of a busy table, but upper left, you look at a chart that was circulating a lot in the early 2000s when I began to do research in this area the presumption that we were running out of oil and gas, that we had hit peak supply, peak oil as it was called. And so the thought that the transition to renewables was gonna be relatively straightforward and easy, possibly accelerated by a price because we were running out of oil and gas and the prices for those were going up and the US was becoming increasingly dependent 
on oil and gas being produced elsewhere and how the world has changed because of the arrival of hydraulic fracturing, so-called fracking, horizontal drilling, and the ability to penetrate staggering amounts of oil and gas, not just in the US, but heavily so to the point now where the US is still an oil and gas net exporter for the first time in decades. Upper right, I heard a question. The last question that Professor Schneider answered uh, was about the Montreal Protocol. And indeed, this is a picture of what drove the Montreal Protocol process, the recognition that there was depletion of the ozone layer. Now, I didn't hear her entire talk, but you know, one of the stories of the great success of the Montreal Protocol has been a combination of regulatory tools and powers but a series of prices and taxes and fees that have worked together incredibly effectively to bring down risks from the CFC chemicals that were widely used in refrigerants and uh, uh, air conditioning systems. Truly, if the Montreal Protocol was one of the great environmental success stories of the last 50 years, Many argue that the use of that tax mechanism and regulatory mechanism for tobacco is among the truly great American public health accomplishments of that period, measured in increased life expectancy for Americans who either reduce or cut off or never use tobacco in the first place in part in response to those policies. And the little slide in the lower left here, the US created in the early 1990s and has continued to implement for sulfur dioxide emissions for coal. A very nimble, flexible system put into place under the presidency of George H.W. Bush with strong democratic support on a bipartisan basis, a so-called cap and trade system that allowed for kind of market-based economic type principles to work. And this has widely been seen as a possible American and even global model for a carbon price. And then those Nordic flags in the lower left, those countries and a couple of others that make up the Nordic governments have done this uh, 30 years ago, 31 years ago, in most of these cases, Norway, Sweden, et cetera. They saw the climate crisis coming. They decided to act unilaterally, even in the case of Norway, which is a major producer of oil and gas, decided to aggressively set just as we had for tobacco, taxes on the carbon content of fossil fuels. They went into place quickly. They are still some of the highest carbon prices anywhere in the world. And they worked. They brought down use and they triggered a really significant transition in those countries early on to renewables, greater interest in energy efficiency and the like. And so there seemed to be this kind of momentum, this inevitability. Uh, certainly the US and globally, that certainly by now, 2021, we would have widespread carbon pricing in play. This is also an issue that has had pretty broad buy-in from economists anyway, in both political parties. Everyone that you're looking at here has been a member of the Council of Economic Advisors and or Secretary of Treasury to either a Republican or Democratic president somewhere between Richard Nixon and Donald Trump. Uh, in the red, uh, in the upper level is my good friend and colleague, Marina Whitman, professor at the University of Michigan, who served in this role under President Gerald Ford when some of these ideas were actually first talked about in the executive branch. Right below her, that lower bar, that's Kevin Hassett, leading economist from the Conservative American Economics Institute, and excuse me, American Enterprise Institute in Washington, DC, chief advisor to President Trump, who has actively discussed over the course of his career, a carbon tax. And to the right of him, the amazing George Schultz, who as you, some of you may know, died at Stanford University at the age of 100, after an amazing life of public service, he was actually one of the architects of the Montreal Protocol that was just discussed in the prior session. And he spent much of the last decade of his life in his 90s talking about the need to create a market-based tool like a carbon tax. He was even writing about this when he was 99 years old. Uh, so broad support from the economics community. Also broad support across the political spectrum. 
lots of Democrats, but these are all Republicans. And I realize we live in an era where parties are divided deeply and there have been real concerns, particularly on the Republican side of the ledger for support for carbon pricing policies. But all of these are former members of Congress, at least two of whom, Senator McCain in 2008, Governor Romney in 2012, who would become their party nominee and part of their platform was if we were elected, we would move to create some kind of a carbon price in the US. In fact, back in the Senate more than a decade ago, John McCain and Joe Biden were talking about some of these various issues and with the assumption that the US would be able to move and go forward with them. So what happened to carbon pricing? Well, I'm sure I am not the only speaker today and you are all where all where that climate change is what we call a wicked problem. To make adjustments, behavioral adjustments, transitions, certainly a, a price on carbon means immediate costs that you see right away. When you pay your electricity bill, when you go to the gas pump, and the benefits are delayed. What would happen if the state of Michigan went to zero greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow? Metaphysically, that's not gonna happen. Politically, it's not gonna happen. How much climate benefit would we actually realize and see now as opposed to 10, 15, 20 years from now? That's challenging. We also went through a wrenching recession. We're going through another recession right now. Partisan divides on environmental policy and climate change have become gaping divides in the last 10 years or so in ways that just weren't in previous periods of American history. Um, so we have very partisan divides. It's hard to bring coalitions together on any issues. The last time any Congress with Republican or Democratic control passed a major environmental bill was 1990. It was the very legislation that President Bush signed on clean air that I mentioned a moment ago. Shale, we found all of this fracking uh, energy to produce more natural gas and oil at low cost, huge economic savings but compounding some of the challenges of putting a price on this relatively accessible and cheap commodity. And my goodness, how sensitive are we to the issue of gasoline? It's a commodity that we see all the time, we use all the time for the most part, and we're very, very sensitive to pricing. Think about Michigan with our horrible roads and infrastructure, and even Governor Whitmer coming into office proposing to fix the damn roads and linking it with a gasoline tax. And every Michigander wants a fix to this problem. How are we gonna pay for it? And how sensitive any increase, even a few pennies in the gasoline tax, which has been the traditional way Michigan and other states have paid for infrastructure might go about this. So these are big, big challenges. And one thing I've been involved in in recent years at U of M is putting together a database on American public opinion on all aspects of climate change, carbon pricing, but a lot more as well. Um, this is a table from a relatively simple question that my colleagues and I have been asking since 2008, fall 2008. It actually, we can run this now through the fall of 2020. Um, do you believe there is solid evidence that global temperatures have warmed over the last four years. And look at those splits. If you ask the same question and have asked the same question in Canada, Europe, Asia, the bar that's the dark color is gonna be much higher. But Americans still remain divided on this issue, although we're consistently seeing, as you can see now, numbers in the 70% level, but still significant numbers of Americans who would argue, not sure if this is an issue or don't think that that's a problem. And we aren't even getting into issues of human causation. So how do you rally support for a huge problem when a big chunk of the American population, the voting population, voting age population, says oh, there's not a problem here to address or perhaps if it is climate change, it's just weather trends and patterns all really tricky. And one of the things that I like to do with my students is encourage them to think about, is it possible to do what you might want to try to do in public policy? Imagine if we were just looking at every possible way, the state of Michigan, your home community, 
your high school could reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And is that technically feasible? Is that economically a good thing to do? But is it also politically possible? And I like to encourage my students to ask, could a government like a Congress or a state legislature and a governor actually adopt this? Can they adapt it and really put it into play? If we talk about everyone buying, having EVs by 2030 or 2035, is that like really possible and feasible? What would need to be done for that to happen? How much money would that cost? Does the policy endure? You know, climate change is something where you don't want to be bouncing back and forth and developing different policies every few years. Start a policy, yank it back. And that tends to be what we've done. But so do these policies last? Do they endure? And the last question by perform, do we actually have evidence in cases where the policy has been used that it does what it's supposed to do? Brings down emissions and does not do economic harm because we don't want people to be hurt. What do we know about this? Well, in the US and other places, the adoption issue of any form of a climate policy, but certainly a carbon price has been challenging. Over 10 years ago, representatives, then Representative Waxman and then Representative Mar uh, Markey led a major effort. It passed the House of Representatives, but did not make it through the Senate. As a young president, President Obama very much wanted to sign this bill. It never even got to his desk. Similarly in Australia, if you're wondering who those two folks are on that couch in the middle part of the slide, that's the prime minister and deputy prime minister of um, Australia elected just before Obama and Biden were elected for the first time in 2008. They ran as progressives and a team committed to carbon pricing. They both took their crack at it. They both faced a really tough backlash. They ultimately had a huge falling out. And to this day, Australia struggles with this issue. And on the right, you may remember Jay Inslee, the governor of Washington, who ran for the presidency, was not successful, but really pushed the climate issue in the 2020 campaign. He's back now in his third term as governor of Washington. He's tried so many ways in Washington to get a major climate bill through a legislature, even when he has a majority of his own party, including carbon pricing. And it's been hard. In some cases, actually doing what we say we are going to do through legislation proves to be harder. Our friends in the European Union tried to put a carbon pricing system in place over a decade ago. They've actually finally made it work in some really, really interesting ways. The price of carbon now in Europe is nearly $50 a ton, and they're planning to use a lot of what of the money coming from this process for what they're calling a green deal, spending on energy transition all across the European Union, which is really a world leader on this issue. Early on, they had problems, they faced backlash, they had differences of opinions between different countries, Poland versus Germany versus France. It was a mess and there was a real backlash against this. We've also seen in some cases, in some American states like New Jersey and New Mexico, but also other countries like Australia, you might pass a policy, but the backlash is so strong, you repeal the policy. You may recall these yellow vests in France last year. Relatively small increase in the diesel tax for partly for climate reasons. People brought their yellow vests out in the street and protested, and ultimately the government backed off on that. And I found in my research, uh, this is from the province in Canada, Alberta, the largest oil and gas producer in uh, Canada, the tar sands, so it's a very energy intensive process to get this energy out of the ground. A former premier named Ralph Klein on the left decided to sort of make Alberta look better than it actually was and created a carbon price, actually visited Washington and traveled to the US and said, hey, don't speak badly of us, we're developing a carbon price. And yet it was set at such a low level and with so many loopholes and some of the money actually went back to the industries that were paying for the tax, it never really accomplished that much. So there are problems with this. There are challenges. And I would say any kind of climate policy that I've looked at in the US or anywhere else, it should not be assumed that it's a slam dunk or that it lasts or that it works. It's challenging stuff.
And we've run into problems like this even on our own campus at the University of Michigan, which I'm going to talk about at the very end of this talk. But then there are interesting counterexamples. British Columbia, the westernmost province of Canada, a premier equivalent to a governor named Gordon Campbell, you see him on the left, decided he wanted to do something serious about climate over a decade ago. His background was conservative. He was really into tax policy and economic kinds of considerations. And at this point, BC, which if you've ever been there, it is just beautiful, fabulous coasts, mountain areas, but also amazing forests. It's a big industry, but also a huge tourist attraction. Um, those forests are not the way that they should look because of some slight changes in winter temperatures, a warming of winter temperatures in British Columbia. That little creature that you see, it's a beetle called a mountain pine beetle, began to proliferate and just wreak havoc on British Columbia forests, forest, destroying them in some respects. This got people's attention. And so what Campbell did was say, I'm gonna have a speech on climate change and he shocked the country. He said, we are gonna run a mechanism of a tax. We are gonna create this tax. It'll be a carbon tax applied to all of our carbon. We're gonna phase this in and every dollar will be returned to British Columbia citizens through tax cuts, dollar for dollar. He ran this through his Ministry of Finance in a short period of time. And some have argued that this is the model case for around the world. They are actually now in a process of going up to $50 a ton, which is a very significant increase and has been seen as having quite a significant impact in reducing uh, emissions and drawn a lot of attention from Americans, other Canadians, but also around the world. Now, even in the Northeast, in the US, which has gone through all kinds of wrenching energy transitions, a little more than a decade ago, the states that you see in purple banded together to form something called REGI. The acronym spells Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and put a cap over all of those states. And REGI has since expanded. It now includes New Jersey, uh, Virginia's coming in, Pennsylvania may come in, and they operate a form of a, a cap and trade system, very much like what I was briefly describing earlier with regard to sulfur dioxide. And uh, there are, are auctions for approval to be able to, to use uh, natural gas, oil, coal, uh, and it leads to a pricing system for electricity. Each state gets its own share of the revenue. And you can just see here the beginnings of how the states have used this. Maine, New Hampshire, New York on energy efficiency, helping low-income citizens pay for their electricity bills, um, other kinds of costs to transition to cleaner energy, subsidizing uh, solar panels and the like. And this has worked and is now beginning to be developed in a program called uh, TCI, the, talk, uh, the Transportation Climate Initiative, for what they call a cap an invest program for the transportation sector and has really drawn attention from all over the world. In Norway, not only did isn't working well, um, all that I was trying to say there when you, I left you with Norway, I think that's where I cut out, is that we also have seen other governments find ways to tailor prices and taxes, including in the case of Norway, not only carbon, but methane, and interestingly enough, and of all places, the state of Texas, given the horrendous situation that they've been in, one thing that Texas has done fairly well is bring on a fair amount of wind, although they did not weatherize them, as everyone knows from the experience of uh, this week. But they used a fee system or a pricing system actually on electricity bills to pay for billions of dollars of transmission. I, my guess is after this week, they're going to be going back to that model and looking at that even more fully. The big point that I wanted to make with these more hopeful cases, British Columbia, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, is that we really have begun to see interesting experience and innovation and practice in this area, as difficult as this is. And it leaves enormous questions for the US and the like in terms of how they are going to proceed and where all of this is going to go and to play out. One of the things that over the course of my research, I have become convinced at that if you're going to seriously talk about a carbon price, which means people have to pay more for energy, readily admit, that's the idea. 
a key on the political side is thinking about, and also impact side, is how will you use that revenue? And in every case that I've studied around the world, whether it's from Europe, the US, Canada, where the policy has been adopted, has been operated and implemented, has lasted over time, and has done what a carbon price is supposed to do, bring down emissions without doing environmental harm or damage, that there has been a link between the price and a particular kind of investment strategy for those funds. As the US has struggled with these issues in recent years, Canada has kept moving. And over the last four years, the government there has basically modeled for the entire country of Canada, a national carbon price on exactly what British Columbia has done. So all of Canada, as part of their commitment to get to a significant level of reduction by 2030, is building not only to the point that British Columbia is going, but actually going to the Norway and Scandic level, carbon taxes that would be over $100 a ton, which are quite a steep program, but trying to find ways to re return that money to Canadians, in many cases, struggling with um, how they're going to manage energy efficiency and other kinds of issues and things. So there's some very interesting kind of illustrations and examples of that from all over the world. And I had a number of other slides that I was going to develop and begin to build. But I think I'll just conclude with one final point. And hopefully this will bring it you know, home a little more closely. One issue that I have been involved in in the last two years, literally the last two years, I've been fairly involved in advising governments, political officials in Congress and around the world on these issues of carbon pricing. But another area where I have been working on these questions is literally on the campus of the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, where I work. If you look at the carbon footprint of U of M, particularly if you include the Ann Arbor campus along with the Flint and Dearborn campus, and throw in things like our massive athletic complex and athletic department, including the big house, football stadium that seats over 100,000 people. And look at our massive medical system, Michigan Medicine, where we have clinics around the state. Some of you may get your healthcare, your families may get healthcare from Michigan medical facilities. We spent months looking at the full carbon impact of everything we do on our campus, and it was staggering. And we have then spent now two years finalizing a plan to try to achieve carbon neutrality at the University of Michigan in a timely way. Uh, this will be rolled out in the next couple of weeks. This is not public yet, but next Friday, our commission will be meeting with our president, Mark Schlissel, and laying out a plan to, in stages, get to initially one definition of carbon neutrality within four years. But full across the campus over the following decade. This will require massive efforts, conversion of our heating system to geoenergy or geothermal, many other things. But a cornerstone of what we're going to do is borrowed literally from the example that I mentioned in British Columbia and the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. We are setting up on our campus what we call an internal carbon, we're proposing this for our campus and all operations, an internal carbon tax $50 a ton and would grow with inflation. That money won't leave the university. It will stay in the university and some of it will be rebated to the schools and colleges and departments that are paying the tax. But a big portion of it will create a kind of a trust fund for loans so that when schools or colleges or departments want to pursue energy efficiency or create a new building that's zero carbon or net zero, the money will be there. And we are hoping that we will become the first public university in the US to do this. Others have, are, have done this in higher ed, but they tend to be private schools, Yale and Cornell universities, Swarthmore College, Carleton College, smaller Bill Arts colleges. A lot of public universities are very active in this space, including our rivals at Ohio State. But thus far, no big public university or any Big Ten university has created a carbon price. And so we're dealing with those issues. And I would encourage you to think as you consider your own high school 
or the colleges or universities that you may consider attending in future years. And I would hope to see any number of you down the road in a classroom in Ann Arbor, post pandemic when we go back to it, but um, to have that opportunity for, for, for conversation. But to realize that colleges, universities and high schools are carbon consumers. And when you look at everything that goes into running a college or university, driving there and back, and how we're gonna to try to pursue electrification of our bus system and reduce commuting, the foods we bring into campus and impacts on methane for different kinds of foods that we eat, particularly beef and lamb, and how we might change the entire Michigan cafeteria and food delivery system. That's gonna be a really tough one. Uh, how do we begin to measure our own carbon footprint in our immediate backyard? Are there steps that we can take? And are there ways to even think about using a, an internal tax or pricing mechanism? One last thing I would say, and I'm really happy to turn this over to questions, is that we're seeing many businesses, large, medium, or small in the US, Canada, all around the world, doing much the same thing. Microsoft, even before Bill Gates stepped down, began to develop an, its own internal carbon price. Dow Chemical and Midland puts a carbon price on all of its internal operations to think through what it's doing and actually to allocate revenue across its system. And we aren't there yet in Ann Arbor. We have some real challenges and issues. We actually have a gas burning power plant right on our central campus that produces a lot of our energy. And that's a big challenge for us. And the utilities from which we buy power in the state, particularly electricity from DTE in our corner of the state, DTE is still around 40 to 50% coal and we don't have ready-made alternatives. So there's huge challenges for this, but I think it's been interesting for me anyway to work with my colleagues going to almost every nook and cranny of the university and ask how as a university can we begin to take this seriously. And we are gonna include, I believe, a carbon price as part of that strategy. And so it's just some initial thoughts about that and that scaling. I do apologize for the, the cutoff and disruption. I had a lot of cool slides to show, but hopefully this is somewhat satisfactory. And I'm just delighted to use any remaining time to, to take any questions. And um, Jacob, do you wanna pose some things? You've had a, probably a chance to take a look at these. I have not looked into the chat room yet. Uh, there's a question. Uh, I run a school green team, but also have an information technology career. Would there be a forum that I can reach out to get a, stru a structured approach to building a career in sustainability? Yes. And is, is the question really more on like an academic degree to lead in that direction? Uh, looks like more of a project manager position. Uh, I think we are seeing. Um, I, let me back up. I am amazed on what my students wind up doing, either with their bachelor's degree or master's degree, once they finish their program. And no two students put together identical programs in terms of disciplines and packages. And I think this is true of colleges and universities all over the world that have begun to hire more faculty and folks who work in this area. And truly the job opportunities, in some ways they're hard almost to know and envision now because of the changes that are already underway in our energy systems. Uh, the kind of project design that's being mentioned in the question, absolutely. But almost across the alphabet soup, if you will, of, of disciplines, this is truly an all hands on deck issue. And the challenge becomes, you know, bringing your passion and energy, finding places that can really give you good experience, put you on a good career path. And as you weigh certainly higher ed options, uh, really being um, careful, careful consumers and driving a hard bargain and making sure any investments of your time and treasure that you put into higher ed are really allowing you to, to go exactly in the path that you want to go. And there are, are just some great opportunities for this certainly within the state of Michigan, but across our border and even across the international border in Canada, which is really moving more aggressively on these issues so far than the United States. So my response to that great question is an emphatic yes. Another question is, what are your thoughts on nuclear energy, specifically thorium? 
I think nuclear continues to play a huge role in the US if you were to take all the nuclear reactors and close them down today uh, and then had to replace them with fossil fuels, the numbers would just go up in pretty dramatic ways. That said, there are real challenges with any areas of nuclear. And I think they're familiar. Uh, thorium is mentioned and the idea of small reactors or new intensive reactors has begun to emerge. Um, but you know, nuclear energy has been very heavily subsidized by the federal government and state utility commissions for a long time. In my home state of Illinois, the subsidies to the remaining nuclear power plants are just staggering, billions of dollars. And so the cost issues of nuclear is really concerning to me. Um, there have been efforts in two Southern states, Georgia and South Carolina to build new nuclear reactors in the last 10 years. Um, both will probably get there, but they are coming in way over their cost. And of course, we haven't even talked about the issue of waste. We have been through a 30 year odyssey in the US of deciding what to do and where to put both high level nuclear waste and low level nuclear waste. We've spent tens of billions of dollars on this issue. We really haven't solved it. I'm impressed what some countries have done. Finland, for example, developing through a broad participation mechanism, a way to look at geological repositories and build public confidence. Um, so I think the science and technology issues are really interesting and important, but the waste issues remain and the political and even the economic considerations emerge as well. We also live in an era where the cost of renewables has come down dramatically and that just for the most part has not happened um, uh, on the nuclear side. The thorium issue, again, I think that's it's a, it's a really interesting one. It certainly merits additional research. And I would say that the U.S. has had some success, and as other places around the world, keeping existing nuclear plants operating longer than they, that they originally had been, because a lot of these were built in the 50s and 60s and weren't really expected to last this long, but we're keeping them in operation because we need that low carbon energy and the reliability of it. So also a great question. So I have a question from your talk earlier. You were saying that um, pointing out the importance of linking any carbon tax to the way that that tax would be spent. Right. And I'm wondering if you were talking about that making it more politically palatable to the public or in terms of the efficacy of the program or maybe both. I, I think it's both. And it's not a finding that I had expected at the outset of my research, but it just emerges in case after case. And one of the conclusions that I've reached is both for political reasons in the near term, but longer term, it's so important when you're kind of telling the story to be able to say to people, here is the cost. No one likes a tax or paying more, but here is how the money is going to be used. Um, Two examples that I talk about a lot in my book. You know, back in the 1920s, there was deep recognition of poverty amongst elder Americans. And there was a lot of discussion, even before the Depression, of passing something that would create a pension for people at the end of their lives, the end of their working careers. And to me, part of the genius of the Social Security program in the 1930s was being very clear that this would be a tax, a payroll tax that any worker, any employee in the US pays on a regular basis, but transferring all of that money to benefits for those who receive Social Security payments. Even the way we do the gasoline tax in the United States, that was actually a strategy developed by former President Eisenhower in the 1950s, who even then, no one liked paying for taxes, but to create an interstate highway system that Americans wanted, no one really knew how to pay for it. And Eisenhower really brought a coalition together to say every dime that you pay into gasoline tax, the excise tax, will go into a trust fund and create the interstate highway system. And it's not as simple as that. And it may differ from case to case how that money would be used. But I think a number of the mistakes that I've seen made in 
sort of opening up this is focusing just on the, the tax and the price and not explaining where that money can go. And again, I think very reasonable people can differ. And when you get a pot of money, how you might allocate that and use that. But building that linkage or connection becomes uh, very, very important. And for that matter, even if we're not talking about pricing, any kind of strategy or policy to reduce carbon use or bring down carbon emissions is likely to disrupt behaviors. It's going to upset some people. How you think about different kinds of funding and transition issues there, perhaps even for those people whose job affected by uh, a transition away from oil and gas, what some are calling a just transition strategy. I think that becomes a, an important consideration as well. And there's actually beginning to be some really good thought on this issue emerging in lots of places. So thank you very much for that question. I'm not sure if we'll have any more time for questions as it is right about three o'clock. So with that, uh, Thank you, Professor Ray, for sharing your Saturday with us. Uh, our keynote with Dr. Hansen starts at 3.15, so we have about a 16 or 15 minute break before it starts. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. I don't think you're seeing any of my slides. Is that correct? Um, we're seeing your desktop, but then the slides don't come back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, let's go without slides and I'll just kind of freewheel in my last minutes and try to slow this down. Okay. Um, but it's for some reason it's not, it's the normal connection isn't working well. Um, all that I was trying to say there when you, I left you with Norway, I think that's where I cut out, is that we also have seen other governments find ways to tailor prices and taxes, including in the case of Norway, not only carbon, but methane. And interestingly enough, and of all places, the state of Texas, given the horrendous situation that they've been in, one thing that Texas has done fairly well is bring on a fair amount of wind, although they did not weatherize them, as everyone knows from the experience of uh, this week. But they used a fee system or a pricing system actually on electricity bills to pay for billions of dollars of transmission. I, my guess is after this week, they're going to be going back to that model and looking at that even more fully. The big point that I wanted to make with these more hopeful cases, British Columbia, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, is that we really have begun to see interesting experience and innovation and practice in this area as difficult as this is. And it leaves enormous questions for the US and the like in terms of how they are going to proceed and where all of this is going to go and to play out. One of the things that over the course of my research, I have become convinced at that if you're going to seriously talk about a carbon price, which means people have to pay more for energy, readily admit, that's the idea. A key on the political side is thinking about, and also impact side, is how will you use that revenue? And in every case that I've studied around the world, whether it's from Europe, the US, Canada, where the policy has been adopted, has been operated and implemented, has lasted over time, and has done what a carbon price is supposed to do, bring down emissions, 
without doing environmental harm or damage, that there has been a link between the price and a particular kind of investment strategy for those funds. As the US has struggled with these issues in recent years, Canada has kept moving. And over the last four years, the government there has basically modeled for the entire country of Canada, a national carbon price on exactly what British Columbia has done. So all of Canada as part of their commitment to get to a significant level of reduction by 2030 is building not only to the point that British Columbia is going, but actually going to the Norway and Scandic level, carbon taxes that would be over $100 a ton, which are quite a steep program, but trying to find ways to re return that money to Canadians, in many cases, struggling with um, how they're going to manage energy efficiency and other kinds of issues and things. So there's some very interesting kind of illustrations and examples of that from all over the world. And I had a number of other slides that I was going to develop and begin to build. But I think I'll just conclude with one final point. And hopefully this will bring it you know, home a little more closely. One issue that I have been involved in in the last two years, literally the last two years, I've been fairly involved in advising governments, political officials in Congress and around the world on these issues of carbon pricing. But another area where I have been working on these questions is literally on the campus of the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, where I work. If you look at the carbon footprint of U of M, particularly if you include the Ann Arbor campus along with the Flint and Dearborn campus, and throw in things like our massive athletic complex and athletic department, including the big house, football stadium that seats over 100,000 people, and look at our massive medical system, Michigan Medicine, where we have clinics around the state. Some of you may get your health care, your families may get health care from Michigan Medical Facilities. We spent months looking at the full carbon impact of everything we do on our campus, and it was staggering. And we have then spent now two years finalizing a plan to try to achieve carbon neutrality at the University of Michigan in a timely way. Uh, this will be rolled out in the next couple of weeks. This is not public yet, but next Friday, our commission will be meeting with our president, Mark Schlissel, and laying out a plan to, in stages, get to initially one definition of carbon neutrality within four years, but full across the campus over the following decade. This will require massive efforts, conversion of our heating system to geoenergy or geothermal, many other things. But a cornerstone of what we're going to do is borrowed literally from the example that I mentioned in British Columbia and the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. We are setting up on our campus what we call an internal carbon, we're proposing this for our campus and all operations, an internal carbon tax, $50 a ton, and would grow with inflation. That money won't leave the university. It will stay in the university and some of it will be rebated to the schools and colleges and departments that are paying the tax. But a big portion of it will create a kind of a trust fund for loans so that when schools or colleges or departments want to pursue energy efficiency or create a new building that's zero carbon or net zero, the money will be there. And we are hoping that we will become the first public university in the US to do this. Others have, are, have done this in higher ed, but they tend to be private schools, Yale and Cornell universities, Swarthmore College, Carleton College, smaller Bull Arts colleges. A lot of public universities are very active in this space, including our rivals at Ohio State. But thus far, no big public university or any Big Ten university has created a carbon price. And so we're dealing with those issues. And I would encourage you to think, as you consider your own high school or the colleges or universities that you may consider attending in future years. And I would hope to see any number of you down the road in a classroom in Ann Arbor, post pandemic when we go back to it, but um, to have that opportunity for, for, for conversation. But to realize that colleges, universities and high schools are carbon consumers 
And when you look at everything that goes into running a college or a university, driving there and back, and how we're gonna to try to pursue electrification of our bus system and reduce commuting. The foods we bring into campus and impacts on methane for different kinds of foods that we eat, particularly beef and lamb, and how we might change the entire Michigan cafeteria and food delivery system. That's gonna be a really tough one. Uh, how do we begin to measure our own carbon footprint in our immediate backyard? Are there steps that we can take and are there ways to even think about using a, an internal tax or pricing mechanism? One last thing I would say, and I'm really happy to turn this over to questions, is that we're seeing many businesses, large, medium, or small in the US, Canada, all around the world, doing much the same thing. Microsoft, even before Bill Gates stepped down, began to develop an, its own internal carbon price. Dow Chemical in Midland puts a carbon price on all of its internal operations to think through what it's doing and actually to allocate revenue across its system. And we aren't there yet in Ann Arbor. We have some real challenges and issues. We actually have a gas burning power plant right on our central campus that produces a lot of our energy. And that's a big challenge for us. And the utilities from which we buy power in the state, particularly electricity from DTE in our corner of the state, DT is still around 40 to 50% coal and we don't have ready-made alternatives. So there's huge challenges for this, but I think it's been interesting for me anyway to work with my colleagues going to almost every nook and cranny of the university and ask how as a university can we begin to take this seriously? And we are gonna include, I believe a carbon price as part of that strategy. And so it's just some initial thoughts about that and that scaling. I do apologize for the, the cutoff and disruption. I had a lot of cool slides to show, but hopefully this is somewhat satisfactory. And I'm just delighted to use any remaining time to, to take any questions. And um, Jacob, do you wanna pose some things? You've had a, probably a chance to take a look at these. I have not looked into the chat room yet. Uh, there's a question. Uh, I run a school green team, but also have an information technology career. Would there be a forum that I can reach out to get a, stru a structured approach to building a career in sustainability? Yes. And is, is the question really more on like an academic degree to lead in that direction? Uh, looks like more of a project manager position. Uh, I think we are seeing. Um, I, let me back up. I am amazed on what my students wind up doing, either with their bachelor's degree or master's degree once they finish their program. And no two students put together identical programs in terms of disciplines and packages. And I think this is true of colleges and universities all over the world that have begun to hire more faculty and folks who work in this area and truly the job opportunities, in some ways they're hard almost to know and envision now because of the changes that are already underway in our energy systems. Uh, the kind of project design that's being mentioned in the question, absolutely. But almost across the alphabet soup, if you will, of, of disciplines, this is truly an all hands on deck issue. And the challenge becomes, you know, bringing your passion and energy, finding places that can really give you good, Experience, put you on a good career path. And as you weigh certainly higher ed options, uh, really being um, careful, careful consumers and driving a hard bargain and making sure any investments of your time and treasure that you put into higher ed are really allowing you to, to go exactly in the path that you want to go. And there are, are just some great opportunities for this, certainly within the state of Michigan, but across our border and even across the international border in Canada, which is really moving more aggressively on these issues so far than the United States. So my response to that great question is an emphatic yes. Another question is, what are your thoughts on nuclear energy, specifically thorium? I think nuclear continues to play a huge role in the US if you were to take all the nuclear reactors and close them down today. Uh, and then had to replace them with fossil fuels, the numbers would just go up in pretty dramatic ways. That said, there are real challenges with any areas of 
nuclear. And I think they're familiar. Uh, thorium is mentioned and the idea of small reactors or new intensive reactors has begun to emerge. Um, but you know, nuclear energy has been very heavily subsidized by the federal government and state utility commissions for a long time. In my home state of Illinois, the subsidies to the remaining nuclear power plants are just staggering, billions of dollars. And so the cost issues of nuclear is really concerning to me. Um, there have been efforts in two Southern states, Georgia and South Carolina to build new nuclear reactors in the last 10 years. Uh, both will probably get there, but they are coming in way over their cost. And of course, we haven't even talked about the issue of waste. We have been through a 30 year odyssey in the US of deciding what to do and where to put both high level nuclear waste and low level nuclear waste. We've spent tens of billions of dollars on this issue. We really haven't solved it. I'm impressed what some countries have done. Finland, for example, developing through a broad participation mechanism, a way to look at geological repositories and build public confidence. Um, so I think the science and technology issues are really interesting and important, but the waste issues remain and the political and even the economic considerations emerge as well. We also live in an era where the cost of renewables has come down dramatically and that just for the most part has not happened um, uh, on the nuclear side. The thorium issue, again, I think that's it's a, it's a really interesting one. It certainly merits additional research. And I would say that the U.S. has had some success, and as other places around the world, keeping existing nuclear plants operating longer than they, that they originally had been. Because a lot of these were built in the 50s and 60s and weren't really expected to last this long, but we're keeping them in operation because we need that low carbon energy and the reliability of it. So also a great question. So I have a question from your talk earlier. You were saying that um, pointing out the importance of linking any carbon tax to the way that that tax would be spent. Right. And I'm wondering if you were talking about that making it more politically palatable to the public or in terms of the efficacy of the program or maybe both? I, I think it's both. And it's not a finding that I had expected at the outset of my research, but it just emerges in case after case. And one of the conclusions that I've reached is both for political reasons in the near term, but longer term, it's so important when you're kind of telling the story to be able to say to people, here is the cost. No one likes a tax or paying more, but here is how the money is going to be used. Um, two examples that I talk about a lot in my book, you know, back in the 1920s, there was deep recognition of poverty amongst elder Americans. And there was a lot of discussion, even before the depression of passing something that would create a pension for people at the end of their lives, the end of their working careers. And to me, part of the genius of the social security program in the 1930s was being very clear that this would be a tax, a payroll tax that any worker, any employee in the US pays on a regular basis, but transferring all of that money to benefits for those who receive social security payments. Even the way we do the gasoline tax in the United States, that was actually a strategy developed by former President Eisenhower in the 1950s, who even then, no one liked paying for taxes, but to create an interstate highway system that Americans wanted, no one really knew how to pay for it. And Eisenhower really brought a coalition together to say every dime that you pay into gasoline tax, the excise tax, We'll go into a trust fund and create the interstate highway system. And it's not as simple as that. And it may differ from case to case how that money would be used. But I think a number of the mistakes that I've seen made in sort of opening up this is focusing just on the, the tax and the price and not explaining where that money can go. And again, I think very reasonable people can differ. And when you get a pot of money, how you might allocate that and use that. But building that linkage or connection becomes uh, very, very important. And for that matter, even if we're not talking about pricing, any kind of strategy or policy to 
reduce carbon use or bring down carbon emissions is likely to disrupt behaviors. It's going to upset some people. How you think about different kinds of funding and transition issues there, perhaps even for those people whose job affected by uh, a transition away from oil and gas, what some are calling a just transition strategy. I think that becomes a, an important consideration as well. And there's actually beginning to be some really good thought on this issue emerging in lots of places. So thank you very much for that question. I'm not sure if we'll have any more time for questions as it is right about three o'clock. So with that, uh, Thank you, Professor Ray, for sharing your Saturday with us. Uh, our keynote with Dr. Hansen starts at 3.15, so we have about a 16 or 15 minute break before it starts. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much.